Welcome to this episode of Let's Be Civil. Today I'm speaking with Leo Dielman on Let's Be Civil. Leo Dielman has served as a program and project manager for environmental engineering projects in the energy, oil and gas, chemicals, and manufacturing sectors. Leo has managed projects involving remediation, decommissioning, and demolition. He specializes in projects where regulatory issues and integration with various entities and disciplines are key factors to project success. Welcome to another edition of the Let's Be Civil podcast. Uh, Leo's here with us today. Um, and, and we've been talking a little bit about some of the artwork over his, his shoulder there, uh, family members uh, going back to grandfather or great grandfather? Great grandfather. Uh, uh, immigrated from Germany to Texas in the 1880s. Oh, so there. So okay. So you'd mentioned you were thinking you were planning to go to Germany. Uh, my wife and I snuck in Germany uh, end of the uh, last summer, about a year ago or so. Went to Frankfurt for for a few days. First time I'd been uh, to to Germany. So um, that's that's. So you got quite a sort of a family history, I guess, on right. Your and, shoulder and, there. and 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 the, and the family is is from fairly close to Frankfurt, probably uh, about fifty. 50 kilometers or so north, uh, northeast of, uh, from Frankfurt, from a little town called Hellenhan up in that, mm. in that area. So, mm -hmm. so tell us, and so, so go back to great grandpa. <laughs> you know, okay. Germany. Um, so how do you get to where you are today? How did I get there? Uh, so, um, you know, well, my, well, you know, the family came over in the 1880s and settled in San Antonio. My dad was an architect. My grandfather was an architect studied in 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 uh, Europe and then uh practiced in 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 Texas in general uh, some interesting story there then then uh, my dad was an architect and I was the black sheep of the family and uh decided to be an engineer uh, I, I I never felt like I was talented enough to be a uh, to to be an architect not artistic enough to be an okay. architect so uh, um you know I I was born and raised in San Antonio I uh I went to high school at Lee High School down in San Antonio and then went to A&M for four years and the University of Illinois for uh, two more for graduate school in environmental engineering. Um, so. so did your did your family actually come uh, from Germany to San Antonio? They, uh, it, it's an interesting story. My, my grand, and it's one of those historic things. If you know a, a, a little bit of Texas history, uh, my grandfather actually, when they immigrated, there was two ports that the Germans came into, and they came into um, they came in either to Galveston, which was the early place, and then they started coming in at Indianola, and Indianola is not there anymore. It was a shallow water port uh, on Lavaca Bay, and uh, then they came overland, um, started in San Antonio. He was a stonemason, and they um, uh, he built uh, basically. Uh, houses and structures all over central texas you know fredericksburg new Braunfels, all over and uh later on you know he had his own construction company he was quite philanthropic in san antonio i have a one picture that you can't see on the wall that uh is the laying of the cornerstone for the fort sam uh conventional chapel in uh at fort sam houston with uh, uh president taft laying the cornerstone for that mm -hmm. chapel uh, so my grandfather was the architect on that. My great grandfather was the builder on it, and uh, uh, so it's wow. pretty cool. So this is why then the, that there are Germans like in New Brunfels, because when we moved here, we were very surprised, right, to, to discover that that there was you know Germans in in uh, Central Texas, right. It, it wasn't something we were expecting to to discover. So yeah, this so is why because they came. They the came over. Right. Yeah. So, so my, you know, the, the area that my great, my great grandfather was from was in Hesha, 
and he he really I guess the the secret is he he left uh, Hesha because that they they were conscripting they were conscripting people to to be in the mercenary armies that they would basically fund the government or the kingdom in 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 Hesha for so. Uh, he came over and then later on went back and got my great grandmother and came back and they settled in San Antonio and mm. were part of that little German community. They weren't really ever part of the, uh, you know, uh, when, when Prince Solm came over and that group that, that started in New Braunfels in Fredericksburg, but uh, they came over a little bit later than mm. that. Mm. So. Oh, learned something today. Yeah. So. <laughs> There's a, actually, it's pretty funny. My dad has a picture of the German the Texas German Heritage Society has a statue in Landa Park in the back part of Landa Park. And mm. it's a, it's a, it's a family, a German pioneer family. And my dad was the model for the little boy in that trio. So uh, if you're ever back there, go, go back yeah, there and see yeah, it. So. Yeah, I'll have to go check it out. So, yeah. So how did you end up deciding to be environmental engineer? Well, it was kind of an interesting path it, you know because of my background I thought you know one I after I decided not to be an architect I, I I was talking to a guy and and he says well you should go into uh, civil engineering because you know you may not be but you could go into construction if you go into civil engineering so I went into civil and and started and and uh the first couple of structural classes that I took didn't really get along with me very well you know <laughs> I struggled and, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I, I, I passed, uh, but I think I, I took an interest in environmental and I'd already, I, I had always had a, an interest in, in uh, the, the environmental. I was in part of a, a environmental uh, summer class in high school where we went around the state and did uh, things, studying ecology and, and, and a number of other kinds of environmental things. And as I took environmental engineering classes as part of the civil curriculum, I, uh, I really took an interest in it. I really liked what I was doing and um, uh, had made a decision that I, I wanted to pursue that. And um, at, uh, I actually worked at the wastewater treatment plant at A&M while I was going to school. I was a, a, a part-time operator and lab technician. So uh, I got paid a whopping $2.10 an hour, I think, uh, back in the day. Uh, and, and, and just kind of that, that interest just grew and grew. And I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm way beyond those times now. And I still, the thing that I love about environmental engineering is that it, it, it's constantly changing. It keeps me challenged. Um, uh, there's something new and different every time I, you know, I, I work on a site, um, Recently, I got to actually go over to Europe, to Portugal, to, to work on a site, on a remediation site out there. I do primarily remediation work now, and uh, it was different. Different regulations, different climate, different uh, geography, different languages, you know, that kind of thing. And it was fun. It's fun. It's, it's, it's been a great career. So. So, so going back to when you started, terminology-wise, you didn't call it environmental engineering in those days. It was the really early days. It was the early days of the conversion from uh, sanitary engineering uh, to environmental engineering. Right. And we really didn't like, you know, sanitary. At that time, you know, when I was studying at a &M, it was it was primarily water and wastewater. That's what we did. And, um, and that's what I thought I'd be doing. I, I took an interest. I really, I loved the wastewater treatment aspect of it. I loved the water treatment aspect of it. Uh, but, you know, part of the coursework that I took, I also took a uh, sanitation class that had some epidemiology in it and some public health things in it. And I, and I took an interest in that. So I, I guess the, uh, the, the softer side of civil engineering just set a little bit better with me than the structural side, but uh, I, I never really wanted to be called a sanitary engineer. I, you know, uh, um, so, so are you uh, willing to divulge the year that we're talking about that when you started? Yeah, so I, 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 I started at A&M in 1975, the okay. fall of 1975. Um, I graduated uh, with my class barely in 19, in December of 1979 um, okay. with, what, what's funny, I think you and I've had this conversation. I had, a, I think I had over 140 hours and that was the standard curriculum yeah, at the yeah, time. Yeah. Um, I went directly to grad school at the University of Illinois and uh, graduated from there in 1981. 
but uh, what I'm kind of uh, getting around to is what 40 years maybe you know if you, if you say 80 you know pretty, roughly pretty, 80. Per, pretty pretty close to 40 so years 40 years ish um this is a this is a part of civil engineering that's probably gone through the most change uh in 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 the profession uh, the, of any of the other ones would you would you say that's true i i i um I mean, you it's know, from, from thinking John. sanitary engineering now, you know, yeah. to environmental, yeah. it's when you, not just water, wastewater issues, we, it, it includes more things. Right, uh, so, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to be prideful. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, we've seen a lot of change in environmental. And, you know, really from where I started thinking primarily water and wastewater to, to what I do now, which is... Um, is is a lot of hazardous waste remediation or legacy site cleanup or those kinds of things and i you know the, the waste management practices you know really even as late as the 1960s were uh you know were appalling i mean i can say that now with judgment uh mm -hmm. but they were accepted waste practices and and anything from you know when you when you'd go to some of the military the DOD bases or the DOE bases and 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 you you know the accepted practice was to go back in the back part of the site dig a hole and cover it up you know put it in there and cover it up right. and 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 we're paying for that or we've been paying for that as as RECRA came in as uh, the Hazardous and Salt, uh, Solid Waste Act came in, uh, you know, the, a lot of as when Superfund came in, we're 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 doing a lot of the uh, the cleanups of those accepted past practices. Mm -hmm. so. so I remember as a student, the the phrase was the solution to pollution is dilution. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so so <laughs> you just you just spread it out. Whatever it was, you. You spread it out and you thinned it out and, and then you just, sh you know, shoved it uh, more or right. less to the side and that was the way that you dealt with it, that's, which, that's, is, which is not true anymore. It's not true anymore. And, and, and it's interesting, uh, you know, we've almost, the pendulum has almost swung. Uh, you know, being an environmental engineer, we're often kind of caught, right, uh, caught in the middle and I think you know, on one hand, we've got uh, an environmental activist community that is really far to the, to the, you know, with climate change and some of those things, which are all a really worthy causes, but it's not all or nothing. It, it, then we have some industries, and I think you've actually seen a movement of industries from a, you know, pollution-minded thing, and I think... Um, a lot of the activists would have you believe that that the uh, that, that a lot of the industries intentionally pollute. I, I I don't find that to be the case. And then you have us as environmental engineers that sit right in the middle, and and try to try to do the best for our clients, uh, and and do something good for the environment. Right. And it may not be all the way perfect. But it, 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 it's, it's practical, it's protective of human health and the environment, and, and um, you know, we're, we're making a difference. Right. Do you have, a, do you have an example, uh, some uh, project that you've worked on that kind I, of I, shows I, some of the things that you do? I, I, you know, I love talking about it. And, and John, you know, I, I know we have a, a limited amount of time, but I, I pulled up a project and, and, and we'll see if we can make it work. But okay. it was a project that I did. It's not necessarily hazardous waste, but it was something that we used a lot of principles that I thought was really cool. It, it, and, it, and we ran a, uh, so now I have to figure out how to do this, John. How do I make my presentation? Ah, here we go. If you, yeah, if you just Share my screen. Yeah. There we go. Uh, let's do, let's do it on, that one's probably hidden. I'm going to do it on this screen. Uh, we'll do it this way. So this, uh, I got to share it. This project, uh, can you see that John? Yep. 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 Okay. This, this project we did, uh, I did at a prior company, uh, uh was, uh, the original, water treatment plant and uh, for the city of Austin. And it sits right at Cesar Chavez and, uh, and Lady Bird Lake and uh, San Antonio Street. And so in the bottom, bottom half of this title slide, uh, you can see the finished product of what we had 
with the with the water plant completely removed. It's so, a block. So the green area, the, the yeah, okay. It's a block from City Hall. So uh, one of the things that uh, that we kind of started this was, and the reason that I put this presentation together was. Uh, sustainability at the time was something that we really wanted to incorporate into the decommissioning and deconstruction. And when you think about it um, from, from that aspect is, hey, we're deconstructing something. We're actually demolishing something. So how can we say that it's going to be sustainable? So we, uh, uh, let's see if I can. So decommissioning basically means you closed down we the facility. And then you removed it. I mean, so this was you. You you, you didn't just walk away from, from clothing because you could decommission it and have walked away. That's that's right. And so we, we you know it was it was the um, how did we shut it down properly, and how did we remove the evidence of this. this five-year-old facility that allowed it for redevelopment and do that in a manner. So, you know, we, we wanted to find a balance about prosperity and, and we, and we, from the very beginning, the city, the project manager for the city really was very proactive about incorporating these principles in, in the project. So, um, uh, a little bit of background. It was built in 24. It's like right adjacent to Shoal Creek, uh, and you know because of its age and its condition, and the and the opportunities for redevelopment in in downtown. It's real close to the. If you've been to Austin in the Seaholm district, that whole area is starting to blow up in the Second Street district in that area. So um, we uh, we had several different. Uh, intermediate projects on that plant we had to isolate the plant from the from the water system so you know it basically had a booster pump it had a pumping station that pumped into the city's water system so we had to isolate it from the water system uh, the, the the bank at Shoal Creek needed to be stabilized we needed to deconstruct the plant and then we needed to restore it back to some semblance of uh, to, to where it was usable um, it, it looked like that uh, it uh, had multiple uh, uh, clarifiers, uh, slow sand filters, uh, reactors, and, and things like that. Essentially, it was a lime treatment plant. They would put lime with water from Lady Bird Lake. Uh, uh, it would flocculate, remove the uh, really kind of more um, uh, turbidity and small uh, fractions out. Then they would uh, uh, settle that out filter it and uh, chlorinate it and put it out into the system. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase what you said in, in regular people. <laughs> lingo here. Right. Um, so, so the water came out of the lake, uh, uh, chemicals Ground. are added to right. it. So chemicals are added to it so that particles actually will, will sort of collect up together, become heavy. That's correct that would otherwise float in, in the water, but when they attract, they, they become heavy and then they, they get, yeah, they get large enough that they, and, and, and they become heavier than the water, that their, their density becomes, or their, their specific gravity becomes denser than the water. And so they, so they fall, they fall out. out, right. And then you, you go through an effort to get rid of that material, but the clean water keeps on uh, moving that's, through the that's system. That's correct. Right. That's correct. Okay. So, so this was the the bank stabilization part of it. Uh, that's what the bank looked like when uh, did it, it. It it was falling down, so there was a need so that the property didn't totally fall into Shoal Creek. Uh, that's what it looked like after we got done with the bank stabilization. Uh, so we stabilized the banks that it allowed for not only the uh, the demolition of the plant, but it also allowed for the uh, it, it allowed for redevelopment later on. Um, and, imp and improve the appearance. And improve the well. appearance. You know, so That's correct. That's correct. Uh, so uh, I don't. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to here. Here's an aerial view of what the plant looked like before we started deconstruction. Um, this is kind of during construction. I'm going to flip through these pretty quick so you can kind of see. As we went, we were. One of the things that we tried to do was mint minimize the amount of truck traffic that was taking materials off site. And we also made a big effort to recycle as much of the material as we possibly could. So this is various stages of the deconstruction as we went. 
ultimately, we knew we were going to end up with a hole. If you go here now, there's actually at least two buildings, maybe three or four buildings on this piece of property right now with underground parking. So we didn't want to totally backfill the hole, but we wanted to make sure that, that the concrete that we uh, generated as we were deconstructing the plant was used as backfill to bring the site back up to grade. So that was one of the things that I was going to was going to say um, here, and I guess this is part of the sustainability uh, component for you is that you there's there's an environmental issue with removing this. Structure. That's correct. I mean, you're That's creating correct. waste. You're creating trash, right? You know, and debris, and so you know, you're you're actually creating an you you're potentially creating an environmental problem by trying to clean up. This right. Facility. So, yeah, no, that's exactly right. We, we, and, and, and if you think about it, you think about the number of, uh, the amount of materials that we had in there. And, and later on, I'm, uh, I'm kind of clicking down to see if I can get down into the slides where we actually look at it. But, but uh, we calculated the number of truckloads we kept off the road by recycling that material on site, recycling that concrete material on site. So, you know, when we looked at it, uh, the, the, the main thing on here is, is, is we tried to reduce, recycle, reuse, and repurpose everything that was on that site. So that meant we salvaged or recycled existing site equipment that we tried to beneficially reuse any existing materials. Uh, in, in some cases, there was nice landscaping all around the plant, and we actually were able to remove that, uh, in, including a, a fairly mature, probably about a, a 18 inch diameter oak tree and move it into parks all around the city. Mm. So we, we went as far as the landscaping material. Um, you know, we, we repurposed significant historical features. So there were some architectural features on the plant that they incorporated into the new main library that's right across Shoal Creek from that. Or they took them and they, uh, they, they used them as feature pieces in different places. And then we tried to reduce the amount of energy, noise, and air emissions that we had from the plant. So um, uh, well, let me ask you this, or, um, and, and people may not realize this, but concrete's actually a, a, a man-made rock. It, that's adult, correct. All the materials right. that go right. into making concrete are, are stones that, that get, you know, uh, reconfigured in a in a specific way, a beneficial way. So if you if you take that material and you grind it up and you get rid of like the steel bars that are in there, you're basically creating now you know little small particles of rock. Could be sand or something like that. You know right. into into that size. And so you could and I don't know if you did this for this particular job, but you can grind up that material and leave it there. Because what you've basically done is is produce sand or small particles right. of rock from a man-made rock, right? And, and and John, that's exactly what we did. We had a, a a grinder on site. We uh, we removed the reed bar and we um and we put the uh, and we put the rock right back in place. That's what we used to fill the hole. Oh. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that I think that we had to look at is we really really wanted that we, we you have to plan for this kind of thing and particularly on a project of this size and one of the things I think was important and 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 really beneficial was is the role that we could play with sustainability in in a capital improvement project there's always places that you can consider the environmental impacts of what you're doing and you can always find ways to to execute that project to implement that project in a more in, uh, environmentally friendly way way yeah. so so that was kind of the intent um we were able to look at uh, i mean this this goes into a lot of details but we we were able to recycle all the primary metals glass porcelain asphalt so when you look at it you know even the ductwork that came out of it and the in the insulation now, now some of that stuff probably did go to the landfill but here you can see look at the uh, i always love the the mounds of rebar that we got out of the, and, and you know, separating the concrete from the rebar was not a trivial thing. Um, and the rebar can get melted, that steel can get right. melted, will go into the manufacturing of new steel. That's right, it went, it went back, 
it went back. There was right. significant uh, structures in there. When when the tre there was treatment equipment that we could put in, there was piping there. So uh, we diverted a lot of this material that didn't go into landfill. It it uh, it, it it didn't put demands on um, uh, on natural resources because we reused what we had. Right. Uh, right. So, and the energy demands. Uh, the, the energy to recycle a material is often far less than it is to produce it from from uh, natural materials. Right. So you, you, if you didn't do this, you would have created a hole in the ground from from digging up everything that was underground. That's right. Um, right. You would have then had to bring something. Either you would have left the hole, or you'd have to go get something new, some new material that would be taken from someplace. And, and and use that to fill the hole. Like you said, there's there's right. buildings on there now, so they you know you you would have to deal with that. And instead, you took the material that was there, ground it you know up in, into a particle size that was manageable, and and put it back in place. That's right. And, and, and it was and safe to do. There wasn't anything wrong with the or well, unsafe about that material. Right. And if you think about that location, it's right, it's in the heart of downtown. It's right next to the hike and bike trail. It's right next to a busy street, Cesar Chavez Street. And the amount of truck traffic that would have, uh, we would have had to do to take materials off site and bring materials back on um, would have been extremely disruptive. Right. And, right. and would have generated an incredible amount of em emissions. So when you right. start to look at all of the benefits to what we did, it was it was pretty interesting. I, 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 I'm looking, so we had about 28, 2,800, almost 2,900 tons of recyclables uh, on there. We, uh, we, we, we relocated in uh, uh, all kinds of things, including vegetation and architectural features, mechanical equipment. Um, that's what the crushing looked like, John. That's what okay. I, 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 you know, so that's what the mounds of trash looked like. Uh, that there was the go. crusher, yeah. the crusher that we used. Uh, okay. This was some of the landscaping that we re, we did. Here's the tree that I talked about that we, that we relocated. They actually moved that a little bit further down Cesar Chavez. Mm. Um, they took some fairly mature uh, crepe myrtles out of there. Uh, so you can kind of see all of this stuff. That's a truckload of the, the, uh, the plants that they took out. Um, there was some really cool old scales yeah. and things that they took out for little architectural features. Uh, Where are the like, American pickers when you need them? Exactly. <laughs> See, and and and, and uh, hand, you know, wheel actuators from the valves. Uh, this was some of the architectural features. Oh, you know, yeah, you talk yeah. about you talk yeah. about con you know you were talking about concrete, and and so I, I immediately went to uh, concretions, and you know, this is limestone that has. Uh, basically, you know, naturally formed rock that has, uh, or, you know, has uh, shell material in it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so you can see those kinds of things. Yeah. You um, save that and you use it someplace else. Uh, some of the original lamps, some of this original tile got saved, and that was not trivial because uh, you can only imagine how hard that was to chip up without just totally demolishing it. Right. Right. Um, so, so let me ask you a question because we're getting near the end. This is this is you know really fascinating stuff. Um, maybe more so than than the other fields uh, uh, within civil engineering. Would you say that there's a, an emotional component with environmental engineering that's not there for structures or you know or, or geotechers? You know, because when you look at the trees being moved, um, you know. Um, and 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 not moving things into a landfill and stuff like that. That there's there's a sort of a an, an emotional we're we're doing something to, to to help save the earth. Yeah, I think I think there is, John, and it's something I think that um, it's interesting. Like you know, I we started this conversation earlier about talking about my family's background, my right. dad being an architect and everything, right. and. And I always thought, you know, one of the misfortunes of being a, a civil engineer sometimes is that there, there's no legacy structures that I have to leave. And I think, you know, what I what what, what I like to think about is, is that a lot of what I do is I, I leave the earth a better place because I'm cleaning up things that that uh, that, you know, that are, are not so nice. Uh, not so beautiful that that are harmful to people and in the environment and and I'm a piece of cleaning those up and making the earth a better place. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's an emotional component to it. Yeah, I think. Yeah. 
Well, it's interesting that you talk about the legacy side of things because that's that is something you know that you hear a lot with civil engineers that that they take a lot of pride in in being able to to point to facilities and say I helped design it, I helped you know renovate it, uh, whatever whatever the particulars might be. But in your case, you're getting rid of things, and so. You can't point to something, or you, or you point and say there used to be this thing there that's not there anymore, and I'm helping. I, I help to make that you know better. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think that that's right, John. And and uh, I, I've in in my career I've cleaned up some. Th this green this green water plant job is a really a, a very clean site. Uh, there was not a lot of environmental impacts other than the concrete on the ground. You know, which is one of those legacy sites that, in the in the right circumstances, you could you could say is a historical landmark. Uh, but uh, I've cleaned up uh, asphalt pits, pits you know from for farming operations, operations, and and you know you go from a, a black uh, a 13 acre, 14, 40 acre, whatever black pit to a green field. It 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 it's it's rewarding. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my my younger son's online going to school, so he's messing up my internet a little bit here. <laughs> um, but so so we missed a we missed a few little little bits and pieces of what you said, but but I think we can piece it all uh, all together. Um, so we're 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 pretty much here um, at at the end. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you. Um, so do you recycle? Okay. Do you recycle in your household? I do recycle in my household. I recycle and, and we're fortunate enough to be in an area of the city that we actually have compost bins that we're able to. So I not only re re recycle aluminum, glass, paper, uh, metal, we, we actually compost, we, we, all of our compost, our kitchen waste and things like that goes into a compost bin that they pick up on a weekly basis. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so, do you, so you've got like separate containers that you put all this in. Yeah. We have a, a 30 gallon compost container that, uh, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an art to it. You got to know when to throw it in the compost bin so that it doesn't <laughs> get really stinky. Right. But, uh, 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 but we do, we have three, three cans, a 30 can, gallon can, a 60 gallon garbage can and a, and a 90 gallon recycling can. And I'll tell you that uh, most of the time the compost bin is full. Uh, the recycling bin is always full and the garbage can is about a third full. Okay. So, so I'll ask you one more question and then we'll, we'll have to uh, call it quits. Um, within your neighborhood, would you say that you recycle more than anybody else? I mean, no, you look I, around at the at your neighbors and what they put out. No, I think I think it's it's I think we're we're fortunate. I, I would say seventy five percent of the people, maybe even maybe even eighty eighty five percent of the people, have a recycle bin out almost on every recycle okay. day. Okay. And 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 just driving driving around, it's kind of anecdotal. But uh, it, most of the time, they're they're full. Okay. Okay. So well, good. And, right. And 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 being in Central Texas, the other thing that you see out on the curb almost constantly is the craft bags full of uh, oak leaves, cedar elm leaves, or some kind of yeah. uh, yard waste because we're you know we're constantly picking something up. So. Yeah. I I would think there's potential if you're in a, particularly if you're an environmental engineer. And like the city that you live in doesn't support recycling, uh, or you, or they do, and your neighbors don't participate. I, I would think that that would be a, a hard thing to to see. Well, an analogous to that, I think you know. Uh, I think one of the thing uh, I, I think uh, New Braunfels has been through it. San Marcos has been through it. Austin has been through it. San Antonio has been through it. Is water conservation, and and it's something that. Uh, when you see people watering, you know, more than they should on the day that not on the day that they're supposed to, it does, it does, it upsets me. Right. Uh, right. I don't, I don't necessarily report them. I try to educate them more than I do that. But, uh, uh, you know, it's important that we, 
that we're doing that for a reason and, right. and you can just watch the lake levels drop you know yeah. um in the summertime yeah i remember when we first moved here that that was that was going on and, and they would report the uh lake levels on you know like the six o'clock news ten o'clock news and yeah it was it was very fascinating and there was a pond right down the road from uh the neighborhood we lived in and it, it was some it was outside of San Marcos, and so there were uh, cattle and some horses and stuff. And and you know, by the time you got to the end of the summer, the water level that you know was clearly had dropped. Uh, right. You know, in that pond because of the lack of any, well, uh, any rain. In, in, in my lifetime, I can remember when San Marcos Springs and in 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 the Landis Spring in 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 New Braunfels were barely flowing. Or you know, they 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 were significantly impeded by because the the Edwards had dropped and we were and we were in uh some particularly hard times when it came to rain so it's it's things that I think you need to be aware of and and water water and in in our environment around it is not an endless resource we need to take care of it and nurture it and do those kinds of things so well you do good stuff you do important you do important work you do good work and and uh I appreciate that well, thank you, John. I yep. appreciate you talking to me today. Yep, yep. Thanks for being a guest on Let's Be Civil. It was good to see you. You too, John. Take care. Yep. We'll see yep. you uh, next time. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Bye.